Hello um, to today's Grattan Institute's uh, webinar on where to next for the Reserve Bank. My name's Shane Wright, the Senior Economics Correspondent for The Age and Sydney Morning Herald. And before we get on get on the way, I just want to begin by acknowledging uh, the Ngunnawal people, the traditional custodians of the land on which I am today, which is in Canberra, and pay my respects to their elders, past and present. And I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. We've got a great panel for you to uh, listen to and engage with over the next hour in regards to possibly the most important financial institution in the country, the Reserve Bank. With us today is former RBA board member, um, distinguished professor of economics and public policy and director of the Centre for Applied Macroeconomic Analysis at the Crawford School, who would also be listening in if he could to uh, the, um, the Prime Minister of Australia, Scott Morrison, who as we are going to hear, is talking about the government's approach to net zero, uh, Professor Warwick McKibben. We also have in Sydney, uh, the Oceana Chief Economist for EY, uh, Joe Masters, who many people have seen picking up on everyday media, to giving great insights into how this country works and how the economy works. Joe's formerly a senior economist at uh, the ANZ and spent more than a decade with MacBank. And Last but not least, uh, the Economic Policy Program, uh, Program Director from the Grattan Institute, where he does work on tax and transfer system, as well as central banking, Brendan Coates. Welcome to you all. Feel free to say hello, guys. Don't be scared. Hi, Thanks, Shane. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Right. So if you're tuning in, then I'm hoping that you are as excited and interested in monetary policy as our three panellists. And the, the past year has been, well, the past 10 months have been quite exciting in terms of central banking. Not only about what the Reserve Bank has done, taking the cash rate to 0.1%, but engaged in quantitative easing, it's also the impact of what the RBA is doing and most importantly, the change in policy that is taking place at the federal level. We now have both sides of the political spectrum backing a review of the Reserve Bank something that the OECD and both and the IMF have both uh, backed in. Uh, Labor went early and now uh, Josh Frydenberg as Treasurer has also said, yep, so somewhere after the next election, which is either March or May next year, that's where we'll be headed. So that's the scene setter for the great discussion we're about to have. But I want to start off with Warwick and ask him what, what to give us a little bit of a taster about the Reserve Bank what's its uh, mandate, how important is it, and what's its, hi its history in terms of fighting inflation? Warwick, over to you. Thanks, Shane, and uh, thanks very much to the Grattan Institute for inviting me here today. Uh, this is an important issue, and I think it will be a very topical issue over the next few months. Um, just to give a bit of background, um, the Reserve Bank Act of 1959 sets out what the goals of the Reserve Bank are, and that is they're responsible for stability of the currency, full employment, and the economic prosperity and welfare of the people. That's very vague, uh, particularly vague when it comes to what do you mean by welfare? And the bank has lent on that in the previous couple of years when trying to justify a certain policy position. In terms of the mandate of the bank, um, uh, the act is implemented through the statement of the conduct of monetary policy. This is an agreement between the governor of the Reserve Bank and the treasurer. It's normally re, in, um, re um, reviewed and, and reissued uh, when there's a new, uh, new government. Um, and so we've had this in place since the original decision by Peter Costello and Ian McFarlane, who was governor designate in 1996 to set this up. And it's very specific, much more specific than the act. And it says um, the goal of the Reserve Bank is setting a target range of inflation between two to 3% over the cycle. And this has been renewed every year, the most recent being uh, in 2016. So that's, that's a bit of the history. The actual um, inflation credentials of the Reserve Bank, it's debated when it actually started. I was on the staff actually in the late 80s and ended up leaving at the end of the 80s because of the high interest rate policy targeting the current account, which I thought was a big mistake. Um, it succeeded in, in actually bringing down the inflation rate, but actually wasn't the goal. But the bank picked up the only good news and made that the, the, the final goal of the bank. Uh, and people argue that around 1993, you could argue that was when inflation targeting became the focus of the Reserve Bank. Uh, 
and they've managed to keep the inflation rate completely in the band during my period from 2001 to 2011. It's sort of drifted below the band over the last several years. And so now there's a very open debate about, well, is that really what the target of policy should be given what we're observing in the world of supply shocks of climate change? Um, you know, what, what should be the mandate? Uh, what should be the policy instruments? Uh, and really, is it a well-designed governance system? I have a lot of issues to raise on that, but I'll let the other speakers chime in now. So, um... I was going to go to Joe because it is now 11, almost 11 years since the Reserve Bank last increased interest rates. Julia Gillard was the Prime Minister. Christina Keneally was the Premier of New South Wales. England would beat Australia and a home Ashes series and Collingwood, most importantly, had won a premiership. We are going, and more importantly on the economy, the cash rate went to four and three quarters. The average mortgage in New South Wales was for a new house, uh, for an established house was 380,000. In Victoria, it was $369,000. Today, it's 761 and 629. Just to give you a bit of uh, taste. So, Joe, I'm gonna ask you now, we've come through the deepest recession and the shortest recession perhaps since the 30s. And now we're into one of the biggest upswings, pushing aside Delta since the 50s. Where are we up to in terms of the, the economic recovery and where are we most importantly in terms of inflation pressures? So the economic recovery was, as you said, swifter and faster than we had expected. And we've had a bump in the road with Delta and having our two biggest states alongside the ACT closed down. So we have a two speed economy at the moment. We've got New South Wales, Victoria and the ACT where we're easing restrictions um, after what will have been another quite significant economic shock. I mean, there's the potential that the contraction in New South Wales in the most recent quarter will be at least as big as we saw in 2020. And then we've got the rest of the country that have only had sporadic lockdowns and are actually continuing to do quite well. I'm quite confident about the recovery process though. Uh, we have supported household and business balance sheets again. Uh, we've got high vaccination rates and the economy was domestic economy was firing on all cylinders going into these latest lockdowns so we will get a recovery i think it's going to be bumpy though and there's a few reasons for that the first one is i think we might just have a longer shadow of hesitancy around getting out and about um there's some early survey data suggesting that may be the case particularly in melbourne um, and also perhaps for parents with unvaccinated children or those that are still unvaccinated what we are seeing though is some other issues crop up in the economy. We've got workforce disruption, um, where we've got businesses that are struggling to operate because they've got staff that have COVID or are having to isolate as close um, contacts or casual contacts. And there's a bit of uncertainty about how that's gonna play out over the next few months. We've seen it very disruptive in countries like the UK and all the modeling in Australia does presume ongoing localised lockdowns, trace, track, isolate, quarantine, public safety and health measures. The other thing we're seeing, of course, is um, sort of, I guess, disruption in the global production chain and very high freight costs. Uh, so that's making inventory management incredibly difficult. And the third thing that we're seeing is skill shortages play up in some parts of our economy. And opening the border will alleviate that, but it's actually not a silver bullet solution. So those three things all together um, are meaning that we are starting to see some inflation chain, which is really the question that, that you're asking in a monetary policy context, not just here in Australia, but overseas. The question is how much of that inflationary pressure is transitory and how much of it is permanent? Um, I actually think some of the supply chain disruption will prove to be transitory. And when it unwinds, it'll be disinflationary. The problem is we don't really know how long transitory may be. Um, so tomorrow we'll get some inflation data. Uh, it'll show a high headline number, still a lot of COVID impacts coming through, but the core measure is expected to be 1.8% annually. And really at the end of the day, wage growth in Australia is still relatively muted. And that is the number one determinant of inflationary pressures going forward. Thanks so much for that, Joe. Um, and we will pick up I think a fair few of that, some of those issues that you've just mentioned. Now, the topic of this uh, 
Webnair is about the Reserve Bank. Now, as I mentioned in our preamble, the Reserve Bank is facing a review and uh, either side of politics is going to go down that path post-election. Brendan, why? How did we get to this point? And I think this will be our jumping off point into a, the broader discussion. And I just want a, he a heads up for people. There is an opportunity to ask questions. I've already got some that have come through. But as you listen to our three esteemed uh, speakers, you'll get there'll be more questions. So throw them in and I will pick the ones that are the most popular and most common that are coming through. So, Brendan, over to you. Thanks, Shane. Well, I think there's really two reasons why we're, we're considering a review now and why pressure is building for that. One is, you know, there is a case to be made that the Reserve Bank probably hasn't done as well as it could have in the last decade. So inflation has been, you know, below the target band of 2 to 3% for something like the last seven years. Um, unemployment's been higher than in certainly in retrospect uh, it probably could have been and growth has been sluggish and that, that, that has real world consequences. That means below target inflation means the economy is not running at full potential. It means the unemployment rate's higher so there's people that are out of work and it means you know a lot of people are probably getting slower, um, smaller wage increases than they could in a world where the economy is at full employment. Um, but it's not just about looking in the rear view mirror. It's obviously that's something we should do because we should think about and reflect on if there's been past mistakes made, what that means about the framework and the governance arrangements and what that means going forward. But it's also because Australia, like central banks the world around the world, has been facing, you know, a pretty tough environment. You know, we're not we're not the only central bank that's struggled to hit our inflation target. You know, in a world of what Larry Summers um, calls secular stagnation, the idea that basically interest rates, the risk free interest rate has um, has fallen and potentially gone negative. Uh, you're in a world where it's the monetary policy is being hit by the problem of the zero lower bound. Conventional monetary policy, you know, is struggling to to sort of reflate the economy uh, in Australia and around the world. And you end up there are big questions going forward about what that means for the efficacy of monetary policy. So what we should be looking at is something that's broad in scope. It should be looking at the mandate, the policy tools, but it should also look at the governance structure. Um, and there's kind of four key questions um, that I think it should be looking at. One. First, if how, if at all, should the monetary policy framework change? Is inflation targeting still the best approach? The US Fed Reserve has gone to average inflation targeting. So that means that they're no longer letting bygones be bygones. If there's a period of undershooting, they're going to make up for that um, by having overshooting in future, which matters potentially in a world where inflation expectations are still pretty muted. Should you have a higher inflation target than what we have today? There's been a lot of academic debate about that. Or should you have something like a nominal income or nominal GDP target? Um, the second one is how do you manage the trade-offs between that full employment, inflation targeting, and then the third part of the bank's mandate, which is around financial stability. You know, that's been one of the issues um, that's been pointed to by some economists as to why the bank arguably kept rates too high, was a concern about financial um, stability and rising levels of debt. Um, but, you know, at the moment, it's not clear about if, as, as the RBA, as the APRA is starting to use things like macroprudential tools to sort of, um, as a separate tool to bring down sort of that, those financial stability risks, you know, it's not quite clear what we're worried about. Is it the risk that banks fall over? Is it the risk that households are indebted and don't consume enough? You know, we could have a much clearer framework for thinking through those things because there are trade-offs. So macroprudential tools have the effect of restricting credit growth. That makes it harder for some buyers to enter the market. It, tends to boost bank profits because it allows them to, to basically, um, you know, price gouge their consumers. And do we have the right institutional settings? Is the Council of Financial Regulators the right one? Um, or should we have something more like the Bank of England, which has a separate subcommittee for financial policy? There's also the third question about the, the link between monetary and fiscal policy in a world of secular stagnation. If we're in a world where interest rates are low and we're concerned that conventional monetary policy doesn't have the tools, so the Reserve Bank can't cut rates further when rates are at 0.1%, it's relying upon unconventional policy like quantitative easing, buying bonds to try to bring down long-term rates and stimulate demand that way. Um, but are we in a world where fiscal policy is going to have to step up? What does that mean? Should there be more explicit coordination between the two? That's potentially quite a controversial question. Or should the fiscal policy body, the Treasury and the Treasurer, have a different set of fiscal rules that allows for fiscal policy to do more of the heavy lifting? And then fourth, just very briefly, there's this question of governance arrangements. So the RBA board, of which Warwick was a member, um, and he's been keen to point out that they hit the inflation target during his period. Um, you know, there is a question about the RBA board is a bit of an outlier in the sense that it tends to have fewer monetary policy experts on the board than other central banks. And particularly, it's got people who are more generalists. 
but those generalists have tended to be drawn from one part of the community. They tended to be business people. It hasn't been a unionist on the board since the 1990s. Is that what we want? Is that the best approach? Now, the challenge there, of course, is if you change the board structure, you have to change the legislation. Everything else can be done through the statement of joint conduct, joint statement of conduct and monetary policy. That would require legislation changes to the act. That's a tricky question. But there's sort of the, the broad set of questions I think um, a review should cover. Thanks, Brendan. I better ask Warwick. This is a we've got a person here who's actually sat around the table and decided. And during your time, rates moved up and down. I, without breaking the confidences that you've you've signed up to, how how does the uh, an RBA monthly board meeting go along? Well, let me let me just preface that that uh, I have it's difficult with the governance structure of the bank. I, I was completely against it before I was appointed. Having experienced it, I now understand why you want to have a mix of experts, uh, more than one, but a mix. You also don't want to have a Secretary of Treasury sitting on the board. That's a conflict of interest. You want to have them providing a briefing, but not a voting right. During my entire period on the board, the board did a great job. The members around the table, we were very lucky to have such good people, very bright, very uh, understanding of the debates and I used to spend most of my time translating from the economics arguments to the business people and back again because they know how the world works it's just that the economic debate uses a different language sometimes so we were very fortunate I can only think of one case which I won't mention where there was a mistake made by an appointee the person being appointed um, but Having said that, that's really a high risk strategy if something major happens. So during the global financial crisis and I was on the board, we sailed through that because we had the good people around the table, but under the current structure, you don't necessarily get that. So it's really the design of structure that can deal with the uncertainty that we face. Um, secondly, the problem you tend to have is that what comes to the board members is a board paper that's been put together by the staff. That board paper tends to make a recommendation and the, de and the debate around the table is about that recommendation. The, the governor would prefer to have a unanimous support and that's normally what you get, although I did present several times, but there's no public record. Um, and so that's important that instead of putting one view to the board, my view would be that you should have multiple views. And what I used to do is I used to actually go into the bank staff to the juniors and talk to them about, well, what did you discuss this month before the board meeting? just to find out what the alternate views were. And then that, I was better informed at the board table because that I knew I had my own personal views, but there's a wide variety of potential views out there. And the bank has the best access to data of any economic agency in the country. So they, they have their hands in real time on local conditions, state conditions, a whole range of, of data. But I think you need that dispersion of views at the table rather than having a sort of a consensus document to vote on. Joe, so I was gonna ask, like. You, you, like you're seeing it as an economist out in the market, trying to inform a lot of people. How easy is it to try and translate from what, from the entrails that come out in the board minutes, or which, the, from memory, the board minutes only started coming out about the time that Warwick came on uh, at the end of your term. Warwick, is that right? Well, we started pushing for it at the beginning, and we finally yeah. got it about two years before I left. Yeah, that's right. So we do, we, we get the minutes which are produced two weeks later and then, and there's also the statement from the governor, six or seven paragraphs on the day. How important is, how difficult is it trying to translate that? And do you think that there may be scope for, as we see with, for instance, Jerome Powell in the US, fronting up to a press conference to try and explain what the bank's thinking is? So I, I think, translating the information that we receive from the Reserve Bank, and, and I would include the statement on monetary policy in that as well, that's incredibly comprehensive and detailed and really sets out their thinking. So translating that is relatively straightforward because the views are totally homogenous all the time, right? So every time you hear from a Reserve Bank official, you hear the official line. So I think understanding where the Reserve Bank's official thinking is, is relatively straightforward. What we're missing, I think, is getting a, a view into what was what is the debate and is the debate robust enough? And I guess that's what you get from the US Fed in the sense that 
there's a range of FOMC members who will talk and quite openly and respectfully disagree with each other or debate issues out. And so you get this sense there's this robust debate going on, whereas I feel like the communication you get from the Reserve Bank's um, pr pretty sanitised, actually, and, and very homogenous in, in what comes out. Um, and I think in doing that, you then get issues like we have today where financial markets are butting up against that official, that very clear official view and trying to push and see uh, where the limits are to that view. And when there's so much uncertainty around us, we're still seeing post pandemic, it, you know, I think you're going to get more periods of this sort of dislocation and butting of heads. And I'm not sure that's always helpful. I was going to say the last year was the first time an RBA governor had done a formal press conference with the like assembled economic journalists of the country because I was on that call. And it's still very weird that, that that was the opportunity you got was one question down the line. And that, that was to explain the decision in March. And then there was a subsequent decision when they went to quantitative easing. Um, Brendan, are they, like we've got to this point, of, it's rem reminiscent of late 18, early 19, where markets were going were, and had listened to the RBA and were pricing in rate rises. And there were a few economists saying, no, that's not going to happen. There was a debate. And then we finally got that decision in mid 2019 where they really changed their direction. How better could they communicate, do you think? I think doing press conferences would be a really obvious way forward. Um, you, I, at the moment, the Reserve Bank, compared to other central banks uh, that we've looked at, certainly looks less transparent, you know, in the sense that you get the, the minutes of the meetings, um, you get the statement from the bank on the day. Um, Phil Lowe and others in the bank, senior people, do make themselves available at speeches and ask questions. Uh, but apart from apart from that, you're not actually getting that much to sort of prosecute the case for different policy positions. And I think that's actually where it it matters. It's not so much what's the bank's thinking precisely, but it's kind of like what's what 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 are the different views that could be put and having that having a, a more robust debate about um, sort of how the conduct of monetary policy unfolds. So certainly, press conferences would be great. You've got the the, how, the Reserve Bank showing up to the House of Reps every six months, where Andrew Lee, amongst others, is is asking them questions. I find that process quite illuminating. You could imagine more of that happening. Where, where, but there are also trade-offs with transparency. So um, the kind of the, the model to say the US has on the on the open market committee is where each board member puts out their expectations and their forecasts. I'm not as confident that that kind of approach of like um, really, really open transparency from each board member would work in the Australian context unless the board was made up of people that genuinely were deeper experts in monetary policy if you're asking everyone to forecast where they think inflation is going to go. And it can change, I imagine, the internal dynamics. But they could certainly be a lot more transparent than they than they are, and that would probably be a step in the right direction. Warwick, if you were putting together the terms of reference for a review, and I'm going to uh, each one of you are going to get this question, what's the one or two key issues? In fact, we'll keep it to one. What's the what would be at the top of your list for any review of the RBA? Well, I think you've got to get the context right, and the context is we're about to go through the most significant structural reform in Australian history because of our response to net zero climate policy. That requires an all of government and opposition uh, framework. It requires coordination, not just of monetary policy and fiscal policy, but climate policy. There's a potential for enormous investment opportunities in the climate space. You don't want the central bank raising interest rates because of inflation when you're trying to do this sort of transformation. This is a transformation where there'll be big shifts in relative prices. The central bank can't really deal with relative price shocks. It can deal with the overall price level over time. So I think it has to be not just an isolated review. It has to be, let's reconsider the entire macro framework facing Australia. And let's put the three macro tools we have, climate policy, monetary policy, fiscal policy. Let's make them consistent. Let's make each of the organisations or institutions responsible for those to be completely accountable, but also independent of the political process in some way. And so to me, you can't just hive off the Reserve Bank and do, if we change the mandate tomorrow, they will have little impact. But if you change the mandate when you're doing a massive fiscal infrastructure program, then having an inflation target is a wrong approach. Having a nominal growth target is a correct approach. 
So really, you have to get the context and it has to be broad ranging and it really does have to be bipartisan. Joe, you've, you're in charge. I've got Major Treasurer. Yeah, I what's, mean, it's pretty... What's on, what's on your list here? Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty tricky uh, to pick one. I mean, I think Warwick's right. You know, what, one path is this really broad-based review of, of all the tools that we've got on the table. And I think one of the mistakes we've made in the past is to expect too much from monetary policy. But if you're asking what would I put at the top of my list for a review of the RBA, which is which is what we've looks sort of to be coming down, down the line, um, I, I think for me, the number one thing would be understanding, not so much if there's been mistakes in the past, but the um, effectiveness and interplay between the new things that we've been doing. So we've got our cash rate, we've had the term funding facility, we've had yield curve control, we've had bond buying or quantitative easing, and, and truly reflecting on how effective has each one of those been so that we can embed those lessons in the challenges that we have for the future. Joe, just to follow that up, like given how much the RBA has done, like put aside the amount of money that the federal and state governments have pumped into the economy, what you've just announced, I think Warwick as a former board member would go, my God, this, was, this has gone on um, to deal with, like these are such big movements compared to where we were even through the GFC. Is there scope for the RBA to actually consider in detail the, the total impact of what it's undertaken over the last 18 months? Yeah, look, I, I think it's really important that we take a moment and learn the lessons. I, I personally think the RBA's done a really sound job. Um, our economy tells us that, right? Not not just through the pandemic, but actually over the last 30 years. Um, we've had, you know, strong economic growth. It hasn't been perfect, but it's been a good job. But I just think that we're in a world where rates are down at that effective lower bound. Um, we're using these new tools, and I know other central banks have used them since the GFC, but no central bank has actually unwound all of those unconventional mm -hmm. tools. So, really understanding the interplay as we head into not really just the pandemic recovery, but the sort of structural issues around climate and also, you know, inclusiveness and intergenerational equity. And as we tackle those, having a better understanding of how all of those bits sit together. And, and then I guess you wrap that around fiscal policy and competition policy and deregulation and uh, other economic tools. I, I feel like it's really important that we remember that monetary policy is you know, it's effectively a fairly blunt tool and we've been asking a lot of it. Yeah. Brendan, we've well, got I think I... Joe as treasurer. You're in charge now. So I've, ni I've knifed her and I've, I've, I've taken taken charge. Um, sorry, Joe. Uh, so <laughs> for me, it would be, I think, as Joe said, a really clear-eyed assessment of the efficacy of the tools because in the world, the world that we're in probably going forward, is a world where you've still got an excess of savings over investment, real risk-free rates are very low. The Reserve Bank is likely to be up against the lower bound more often than it has been in the past. And so what do you, how do you deal with that situation? Um, so if you're in a world where you're trying to use unconventional tools, uh, we've pushed in the past that they probably should have gone further with some of those unconventional tools given the outlook, things like negative rates. Um, but there are questions about are those tools sufficient to get you back to a world of full employment and hitting whatever your monetary target is? Um, and therefore, what's it's likely to us that um, fiscal policy is going to have to be calibrated in a different way to help support macro stabilisation going forward. I'd probably disagree a little bit with Joe that, well, the last 30 years, I think the Reserve Bank has generally done a pretty good job. The last decade, I think things don't look quite as rosy. Since kind of 2012 onwards, wages growth looks a bit a bit a week to us. Unemployment, I think in hindsight, looks higher, higher than what we thought because perhaps we didn't think the NIRU would be as low. So the rate of unemployment at which inflation would start to rise. There's clearly been more slack in the labor market than, than we expected, but perhaps also that we could have seen at the time. So, you know, if I'm treasurer, I'd be thinking about what a review of the bank does, but I think I'd also be thinking about what my fiscal rules are. You know, how am I going to um, support the economy and support the macro economy on the fiscal side um, maybe not focus so much on trying to cut down debt levels as a target, maybe think more about the sustainability of debt repayments relative to GDP. Uh, because if we're in a world where it's sort of at this sort of this liquidity trap, 
then it's going to be hard for the central bank to get us out of it alone unless the fiscal side helps us reflate so that inflation goes higher, real interest rates can go lower to support the economy coming out of COVID. I was just going to follow up, Brendan. We have had the target of 2 to 3%. Uh, that's the inflation target of the RBA. And that was set at a time when inflation was much higher, where the repayment of debt, and historically the biggest debt came out of World War II, and it was effectively inflated away as well as po a huge population baby boom. We've got to a point where the federal government's fed, uh, gross debt at the moment is about $850 billion. But we've never had to pay down debt with an inflation targeting reserve bank. In fact, it, it, and so that question of inflating away debt seems very difficult. Would you agree? Well, the question for debt sustainability is what's your interest rate look like compared to your nominal GDP rate? Um, growth rate. So if nominal GDP is growing faster than, than the debt, the repayments on you're making on the debt, then, you know, debt to GDP will fall. You know, this was Olivia Blanchard gave a famous speech to the American Economics Association along those lines. Um, the concern is if you try to cut fiscal, cut, consolidate too quickly, you can see what happened, you know, in the Eurozone over the decade between the GFC and COVID, which is, you know, you try to consolidate, your economy runs below potential and debt rises relative to GDP because you've, you've reduced the denominator, you've reduced your GDP growth rate. So coming out the other side of this, it looks to me like debt is perfectly sustainable at the kind of levels that we've got. Uh, you do have to worry about the fiscal um, deficit in the long term, um, particularly with an aging population. Uh, but the thing that you want to avoid is the fallacy of, of cutting back too early to sort of consolidate your fiscal position and then it has the opposite effect to which you hoped that you end up debt rises to GDP because your GDP is smaller than it should be. Uh, and so there is a case for going the other way that sort of accepting a slower pace of consolidation in order, and that will be better for debt dynamics and for macro and economic wellbeing more broadly. And I just um, add to that because Brendan makes a really important point, And that is it's nominal growth that matters. And the two components of prices and out <coughs> output, I'd rather have, normal GDP growing because of high productivity growth. But if I can't get high productivity growth, I'm happier to have higher inflation. That's where a nominal growth target or a nominal GDP target enables you to have that flexibility. We know that if growth is weak and coming into this crisis, coming into the COVID pandemic, we were trending down in productivity growth. We have now had a fair chunk of our growth coming from uh, labour force growth from immigration cut off. So I think we really want to try and get higher inflation if you haven't got the productivity growth. There's nothing, there's nothing in the trade-off that says that high inflation is a bad thing if, if you can keep nominal growth run, running. And we're not talking about outrageous inflation. We're talking about if growth goes to zero, then nominal uh, growth target of 6% would allow 6% inflation of goods prices, not CPI. And there is a difference between that. And that's a whole debate about whether the inflation target is the appropriate one. That's a different story. But I think that's where we've got to focus now. Nominal growth is what we need. I was going to come back to you. Uh... Warwick, because of your, your commentary around, say, uh, climate change and and how we take that into account as uh, how the RBA would take that into account. One of the debates has been over the last few, you know, few years is that the, the RBA became more focused on financial stability to the perhaps to the exclusion of other key parts of its mandate. Is the RBA or is any central bank in a position where it can balance say the compete they are some of these elements are competing pressure about price stability about full employment we add in climate change and we in our question section we'll get into housing and the housing market and how is a central bank able to carry that sort of load well the optimal the optimal allocation is one target for one instrument and the reserve bank has several instruments now because they've got some alternative policies of part from interest rates there's too, many, there's too many instruments there. The reason climate change is important is not because the Reserve Bank should be doing something about controlling the climate, but they should realise that the climate shocks, and we've just released a study earlier this year looking at both trends, changes in climate, as well as extreme events, that takes about 100 basis points off the real interest rate. The demographic change we're seeing in the world is taking about another 100 basis points off the real interest rate. These are all bringing down the real interest rate to either zero or negative, and Brendan has already made that point. Um, that's a real problem for a central bank that uses interest rates to stabilise the economy. And so I think the bank should be focused on nominal growth, 
financial stability is a concern, but you can always cut, if you've got high enough interest rates and you end up with a problem of financial instability because you didn't get the macro pro right or whatever, you can always cut interest rates if you have to. Um, and that's what, you know, that's like a medical, I've come up with many medical analogies to that. You don't, you don't cut interest rates just in case you have to cut them. And this is the problem of, of using financial stability as part of one of your, one of your instruments, one of your targets for, the, for your single instrument. So you don't want too many instruments. You want as many instruments as you can. And that means fiscal policy, that means climate policy, that means a whole range of tax reform in particular, shifting from income-based taxes to consumption-based taxes, a whole range of things we could do, which the Reserve Bank doesn't have any influence over, but has to respond to. And that's, that's a key issue is making sure that the Reserve Bank response doesn't counteract the policies you're doing in different places. Guys, we've come to the section where we're going to take some questions from our listeners and they have flooded in. But Joe, you get the first one. And I feel I'm like just, you're smiling before you read that out. I know. And I will simply point out that five months ago, a house two doors up from me, not if anyone's been to Canberra, they know ex Govy house, it, you will bulldoze them very quickly. Uh, this has been unchanged from 1973, sold for a million dollars on about a 700 square metre block. On last Saturday, it sold again. The uh, new owners didn't, hadn't, I think they changed the top of the shed out the back. It sold for $1.217 million. Now, 20% return on five months. Look, uh, I, I know some Ponzi, I've met some Ponzi scheme operators who don't even offer that sort of return. So, and you will not be surprised, one of the, a lot of the questions we're coming through is monetary policy and housing prices. Sh it, the starting point is, should the RBA be worried about housing prices? If they are, or, or can they do anything to mollify what's going on? Or is this outside its remit? So I'm going to give the typical economist answer, which is yes and no, right? Um, <laughs> So I, I think when we're talking about house prices, there, I mean, there's many facets to it, but let's separate two. One is around housing affordability, right? So the question and the debate often comes up when you read out stats like you've just read out, Shane, is how, is my, how are my children ever going to afford to buy a home? Is this fair? Is this equitable? Um, that is the remit of the government. Right. That's a distributional equity issue. It, it doesn't sit within the RBA Act. Um, what the RBA worries about is financial stability. Uh, and that is our low interest rates fueling a housing boom that is going to end with a debt crisis. And debt crisis ends in an economic crisis, which impacts people through jobs and livelihood and their welfare. Um, now, we know that in the last year, um, I guess if you if you go back to the start of the pandemic, everyone thought closing our borders, which as Warwick said, sort of saw this massive shift in, in population growth, uh, would see house prices fall. And we did see house prices fall for a couple of months. But then what happened is two things overwhelmed it. One was uh, interest rates fell, particularly fixed mortgage rates around that three year mark fell quite considerably. And people's unemployment expectations uh, didn't rise that much because we supported the economy that well. So unemployment expectations and, a, and nudging lower interest rates fueled this boom, alongside the fact that Australians couldn't spend money on expensive overseas holidays, were spending a lot of time at home and decided that either buying a, a property or upgrading was a, was a good idea. So, um, you know, we've seen this big fuel. Are we seeing... Um, issues around financial stability? Well, yes. I mean, we've got, you know, one in five new mortgages has debt to income of over six um, times in terms of its ratio. But what we've seen in the last few years, in, in my view, um, is macro prudential has been incredibly effective at slowing without crashing the housing market. And the reason I say you don't want to crash it is two out of three Australians own a home. So housing affordability is important but you've also got this stock of household wealth and the wealth channel when you're recovering from an economic crisis is really important. So my, my own view is that macro pro is um, the right first step. It can be well targeted. It can be um, brought on and taken off uh, quite well. And the last two times we've used it, it's been incredibly effective. Brendan, Brendan, do you have a view? 
Yeah, well, look, I'm I'm trying to sell a house and trying to buy a bigger house, and um, so I'm acutely aware of the scenario you've just laid out, Shane, um, over the course of the last couple of few months in the Australian housing market. Look, it's clear that low interest rates rise raise prices, right? That is one of the channels through which they work. Monetary policy works. It is also just a, a, a mechanical effect of you know the the fact that Australians borrow to buy housing, and the rate at which they borrow is the interest rate. So if you cut rates, service people can afford larger mortgages, and we are in that position now. Um, what should the RBA do about that? Well, it's not the RBA's job, right? And so I think the idea that you'd use macroprudential controls to sort of like cut prices per se is probably not where you would go. Um, it is very effective. Some of the work we did after the 2019 election showed that when the RBA, uh, when APRA introduced those, um, those loosening of the serviceability buffers, the level of the interest rate you're assumed you had to repay in order to get the loan and make sure you can afford it, you know, house prices exploded literally the next weekend. Um, what does it mean for for monetary policy or for, for housing markets themselves? Well, affordability isn't really just about the price you pay, it's about the interest rate that you're paying and therefore the cost of servicing the loan. The, the issue is more one of sort of wealth inequality. It's one where um, people's assets are rising really quickly. It's a study that we're probably gonna do is looking at the impact of monetary policy on inequality in Australia. Um, that we haven't seen, there hasn't been as much work done on that in Australia than elsewhere. But the solutions to housing affordability probably sit outside monetary policy in the RBA, because if you did cut, if you rose rates now, you know, this is the sort of what the RBA did is essentially it didn't cut rates, it did the opposite pre-COVID. Uh, and, you know, we looked at that scenario and thought, well, that you, you're basically allowing unemployment to be higher than it should be, wage growth is lower than it should be, that has huge economic costs. Um, that's probably the Reserve Bank has since said Governor Lowe is implied when asked, will you raise rates to forestall debt? And he's basically said, no, is to me an admission that that was probably not the right strategy. You've got to look at housing taxes, you've got to look at supply, the whole rest of the story. It's not an RBA issue. I was going to uh, ask Warwick, um, for instance, earlier this year, New Zealand's central bank was given by the Ardern government responsibility for housing. Um, and now, and out of we now have. Well, you go back, I think it was 98 when APRA was created separate to the RBA. Do you think that's worked, keeping the macro, like APRA's technically responsible for macro pro and conditions over the lending sector? Should they be separate from the RBA? Well, I think that was a good, I think that was the right move to make, as long as you coordinate. But coming back to Brendan's point, housing prices are a function of demand and supply. If you want to, if you think housing prices are too high, which I don't think they are, because if you do the present value of the future stream of returns at a zero or negative interest, real interest rate, um, the prices are doing what you'd expect them to do. The big concern is what if you put interest rates back to more normal level? How sustainable is the is the system uh, under those circumstances? That's that's a worry. Um, but secondly, supply can be easily adjusted and demand can be adjusted. Demand can be changed by changing capital gains tax, by changing the land, shifting to a land tax based source of income, tax the houses, tax the land. You can change supply by releasing more land. The problem we have in the ACT, for example, is I think they hold land back to make the land values go up because that's a key source of government revenue. So there's a lot of perverse incentives in government at the state and local level to prevent the land being released that's needed to be released. I mean, we have a shortage of affordable housing in this country. Yet we have a housing price boom. So I think there are, every, and Brennan's right, outside the, outside the RBA's mandate, outside of its control, it should be focusing on what it's doing with interest rates to stick to uh, a, a full employment, low inflation economy. And you can't give too many, uh, too many goals to a central bank. It's got to be, again, across the board with all the various levers of macro policy. Um, Jump in, and I, I think that's a really important point, Warwick, this idea of how many tools have you got and how blunt a tool is it? And then how many objectives, what are we asking of monetary policy? And I guess when you think about full employment and inflation, they're, they're connected, right? They're related. Whereas if you think about asset prices, they don't necessarily sit with those two as easily. Yeah, but the bank has to be concerned about the asset price too. It has oh, sure. to be because when it stops or if it stops, they're going to have to deal with the mopping up together with the fiscal authorities and state government. So they have to be aware of it. They have to understand it. But really, there's not much you can do about it. Now, when I was on the board, we did do uh, quite a lot of manipulating of interest rates to try and deal with the house, housing uh, price surges uh, 
in, in the early 2000s and, and both Governor McFarlane as well as the changing interest rates were very effective in taking the steam out of that housing boom. But there are housing booms which are speculative and there are housing booms which are driven by fundamentals and zero interest rates is a fundamental in my view. Um, it's not as if the U, what we've got the situation that we had in the US where there were people were building houses and they were empty. And so the prices were going up, but there was no rental return. There was no fundamental. In Australia, the rental rates, you know, the houses are fully rental, rented and the re rental rates are consistent with the price in my, my understanding across most jurisdictions. They've got to look at the fundamentals. And I think under the current circumstances, they're suggesting that the prices are what the prices should be, but interest rates aren't going to stay zero forever. Um, I wanted to, this has come through a fair few of the questions. It's about fiscal policy. And it actually sort of touches on Warwick's point earlier about I wouldn't have the Treasury Secretary, I'd have the Treasury Secretary on the board of the Reserve Bank, but not have voting rights. And you've, you've all mentioned the interaction of fiscal and monetary policy, but how do you do that? at the RBA level, given the, the sort of culture that's been created over the last 30 years where a treasurer is asked about, say, interest rate policy setting and says, that's a matter for the Reserve Bank. I don't have, a, I'm not going to articulate a view. How do you sort of segue that interaction? Uh, jo? I think that's a really good question and a really hard one to answer. Um, and I think it's something that's being debated not just here in Australia, but around the world. And, uh, you know, I, I guess things like modern monetary theory, for example, are, you know, ways of try, trying to think about, about those issues. Um, I, I think if you want to have a central bank with an inflation target, then you have to have a degree of independence. And you need that for credibility. And without credibility, your inflation target doesn't work because it can't anchor inflation expectations. So I think if um, you've got to think about what the target is for your for the RBA, and that, in a sense, sort of sets the parameters for what sort of connection you can have. I do think we've had, um, to Brendan's point earlier, I guess, increased um, levels of communication. You know, we've now got the governor, obviously, uh, you know, um, at um, Parliament giving his testimony a couple of times a year, and I think that's really important. But I, I don't have the silver bullet answer to how you make sure that they're all working correctly. And I, I think this idea that fiscal policy will need to play a bigger cyclical role is correct, but we haven't done that really before. And so we're really in uncharted waters. Brendan, you're... you're uh on the boat in these uncharted waters. What's your what's your thought? Yeah, well, uh, when it comes to housing, I'm putting my money where my mouth is and probably buying a bigger house. Um, <laughs> so you can come back and ask me in five years time whether I thought that was a good idea. Um, I think on the fiscal side, I think there's sort of two sort of questions. There's a question of kind of what's the overall fiscal stance, how expansionary it is or contractionary it is in, in, with respect to the macro economy. Look, if we're in a world at the zero lower bound, you're probably in a world where fiscal policy has to be more expansionary than it has been historically if the Reserve Bank doesn't have the tools to push the economy back to full employment. And as, as, as Warwick said, debt sustainability is all an issue of the nominal economy because that's the nominal economy is what you're using to pay back debt and, and service interest, interest costs. So there's a question about the overall fiscal stance, which is one of rules. What rules the central, the, the, the treasury and the treasurer adopt for as they come out of COVID? So far, they've been pretty open in, in, in saying they're going to keep fiscal policy settings, you know, pretty expansionary up to the point where until they think unemployment's back down close to where sort of the rate of full employment. The second part of it is institutionally. So if you're in a world where the central bank is going to run up against the, um, as it manages the cycle, is going to run up against the zero lower bound more frequently, is there a question of getting better automatic stabilizers for your for your in the conduct of fiscal? You know the kinds of automatic stabilizers that we where those things often correlate very strongly with size of government. So, so governments that have tax and spend a larger share of GDP tend to have larger automatic stabilizers by their nature. Um, that's a very controversial issue. Size of government is kind of like a bedrock of the differences between the different parties in Australia, uh, political parties. There, you can also do it though in a more rules-based way. You know, do you have something like you know this idea of the SARM rule, where you have higher rates of unemployment benefits, unemployment insurance in a world where you know the unemployment rate rises by say 0.5 percent over the course of a few months over a relatively short period. There are some, you know, that suggest you should have like an independent fiscal authority to sit alongside an independent monetary policy authority. 
I have my doubts that that's an effective approach, essentially because, you know, fiscal policy is very political. You know, it captures so much of our values about how we want to distribute income in the economy, what kind of society we want to live in. I find it hard to imagine sort of fully separating that in a technocratic sense, but there are things that you could do, you know, could you use the Commonwealth Grants Commission at the state level to sort of redistribute more income to the states in years when the macro economy looks a bit weak? Are there, should you have the parliamentary budget office providing that role of, well, here's kind of like where the fiscal, here's, here's, here's the sort of the state of the macro economy and what fiscal the support fiscal policy should provide to the economy? Should that be a form of research? These are the kind of questions that wouldn't sit within a review of the bank, but are questions we're going to have to consider because the Reserve, review, the Reserve Bank itself may not have quite the level of tools and support it needs to fulfil its objectives going forward. That's one of the big questions I think we're grappling with. Um, Warwick, I was coming back to you, the same question. I've, I've seen some of the detail that's come through from uh, Scott Morrison's announcement. And one of the key ones today is we'll spend at least 20 billion on low emissions technologies. Uh, there's no detail about how much we're going to pay off into the regions to keep the nationals at, at, at happy at either. But that you uh, there is a discussion right now about that climate expenditure, which will form part of the fiscal response to climate. Again, how do you balance the the RBA's monetary policy provision and and taking into account an increased fiscal policy position? Just on the climate issue, there's two aspects of climate change. One is climate shocks. Climate shocks are supply shocks. That is, you get a bad climate event, you get a drought, you get a flood, you get uh, something, some other major event. That actually reduces output and increases prices. That's why supply shocks aren't handled well by an inflation targeting central bank because inflation goes up, so you tighten policy so output falls further. Supply shocks are very well handled by nominal growth rules. So from a, from a climate shock point of view, um, that's one set of issues. The second set of issues is the climate policy responses, which are, so the first is called what we call um, physical risk. The second is what's called transitional risk. So suppose you put in place climate policies in Australia, an efficient climate policy would actually raise the price of carbon. It would also cause a, a change in the relative price. Carbon intensive products become more expensive. Uh, renewable generated products become either less expensive, but the relative price will definitely shift, right? Again, relative price shift that the central bank has nothing that can deal with, except it doesn't want to lean against the higher inflation coming from the, the energy price, potential energy price shock. Uh, it just wants to let that see through that and let it wash through the economy. So on the fiscal side then, what's needed is really an infrastructure program, a green infrastructure, because the money ultimately to transform the economy is not going to come from the government. It's going to come from the private sector, private investment, and what's key there is firstly to have a plan because investors will have very high penalty rate, uh, will face very high financing costs if the policy is not clear. So firstly, the government needs a plan. And then there are things which the private sector can't provide because they, there's public goods aspects to them. So you need infrastructure, you need to improve the grid so that you can have more renewables come into the grid. You need decentralization of generation. You need a whole range of decisions which require government action. And then the private sector investment will come. So it's not all about technology. Technology is part of the answer, but really, if you don't change the relative price of carbon intensive products relative to other products, it's going to be very expensive to hit an emissions target because you need to change your behavior throughout the entire economy, not just on how you generate electricity, not just on which car you drive. You need to have a very comprehensive carbon pricing strategy at, to get least costs. Thirdly, there will be structural issues in, in, in both sectors of the economy and regions will be impacted differently. We know we think right now that the fossil fuel intensive regions will be hurt, but there's going to be a whole range of new technologies and new industries emerge. Hydrogen economy, green steel, there's a lot of new innovation which could occur in these regions. So you've got to be very careful when you design this, that you don't, you don't, it's like, it's like the um, response to the COVID pandemic. You give a whole bunch of companies a whole bunch of money and some of them walk away with a bonus when they shouldn't have got it in the first place. So you've got to be very careful how you design the redistribution aspect of this. It has to be an evolving policy, but there's a lot of upside on the infrastructure side. Once you get infrastructure moving, the private sector will be coming in and providing the transformation. That's quite complicated and it's not, you can't plan that. You have to create the, uh, the environment for this to occur and then the private sector comes in. If you do too much command and control, you end up like you know, the Soviet experiment uh, just doesn't work. 
Well, let's well let's not hope we uh, replicate the Soviet uh, response to the economy. I've got a couple of quick questions and so short answers. Joe, I'm, you're back as treasurer because you knifed Brendan again. Um, <laughs> who who's your next appointment, or what sort of person do you need to appoint to the RBA board? And Warwick and Brendan, you get this chance as well. So, Joe, you don't have to give me a name, but perhaps the, the person you're looking for. Yeah, look, I think there is a role for a professional economist to be on the board, someone that can look at the board papers that are presented. And we've already talked about that. So, you know, only those board papers are debated and discussed at the board. So you need a professional economist that can ask those deep questions around the work that went on before those board papers. Brent, Brendan, it, it's your chance now because you've got rid of Joe again. <laughs> I'm happy just to serve as a treasurer, I suspect. Um, <laughs> so, the RBA board, Brendan. <laughs> okay, well, you can you can sell me off with an appointment to the board instead, Joe. Um, so, I think for me, I would probably look at getting some at the risk of sounding like economists pushing for occupational licensing. Um, we are, I think there is probably a need for a bit more economic expertise on the board. Um, but I think maybe a, a, a question is, do you change the structure to have a separate subcommittee that does monetary policy uh, rather than having the board itself that oversights the RBA as a whole be the, be the, be the body that's also conducting monetary policy? Um, I would look at getting some international expertise potentially. You know, I think as other central banks do look globally, you know, Mark Carney end up as, you know, head of the Bank of England. Uh, but I think the actual more important question is less who's on the board and, and it goes to the point Warwick made before about the structure is the B Bank of England has more of a culture where different views are put to the board. So the board gets sort of presentations from different members of staff that put the to competing views. That to me seems really important in the decision making process rather than just here's the here's the, the executive's view of the whole process. You can have people with different views that you get a better cut and thrust in the debate. And I think it leads you to a better answer, irrespective of what that answer may end up being. Um, Warwick, we've got rid of Brendan because as a politician, he's waffled again. So in terms, what sort of person would you be putting onto the board? So just a bit of advertising. So my centre at the <laughs> Centre for Applied Macroeconomic Analysis has a shadow RBA board. Uh, and that shadow board, any one of those members could actually serve very effectively as a real board member. But outside of that group, we have about 240 of the world's leading macroeconomists in our centre from all over the world. You could put any number of those on the RBA board and they would do a fantastic job. So there's no shortage of supply. There's an insufficient demand. Uh, spoken like a true economist there, Warwick. Um, and I've got, we've got three minutes. I've got 30 seconds and this has come up quite often. Cryptocurrencies. Joe, should the RBA, how should the RBA be getting, in, should they be getting involved in cryptocurrencies? And will that have an effect? You've got 30 seconds, Joe. That's it. I think they're exciting. I think there's a future in digital currencies. Um, I love all the aspects around financial inclusion, but to keep the system and keep people safe, they need to be regulated. So there is a role. Brendan, I've given you one last chance. 30 seconds. Come on. Look, I can't claim expertise in the area, so I'll pass. <laughs> that is very unpolitical unpolit of you to give a chance to turn down a microphone. Warwick, what do you think? In fact, this wasn't an issue for you when you were on the board, really. Um, it was beginning to become an issue because I actually was involved with a couple of startups early on, um, which, had a, which caused me to have a conflict of interest, so I couldn't actually do anything about it. Um, so I would just say that I think the distributed led ledger blockchain technology is a really great way to move forward. Central banks should have their own currency in that form. But the standard cryptocurrencies that people speculate with, we shouldn't allow them in the financial system in the first place because they're Ponzi schemes. And I think we've, we've moved through a fair few issues. We've finished up on Ponzi schemes and uh, we've had three or four changes in Treasurer um, while we've gone through this. I just want to say uh, thank you. Uh, to all our speakers today, Brendan, Warwick and Joe, for all of their insights. I think all of the people listening in have really picked up a lot of interesting tidbits and insights into the world of central banking. I want to thank the Grattan Institute for putting this all together. Uh, Brendan and his team, Beatrice, thank you so much for organising this herd of cats to make sure that we're all together and talking. And I'm sure Grattan has plenty of 
future webinars that are worth listening in. So thank you all and uh, tune in again.